On episode 343 of the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we bring back Dr. Johnny Bowden and discuss his book, The Great Cholesterol Myth. You can find the full show notes for this episode at 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash 343. Have you decided you're ready to make a change? To reclaim your health and fitness. The 40 Plus Fitness Podcast is here for you. I'm your host, Alan Meisner. I'm an NSAM certified personal trainer with a specialization in corrective exercise and fitness nutrition. Let me be your coach as you find your way on your health and fitness journey. All right, let's go. Our guest today is known as the Nutrition Myth Buster. He is a board-certified nutritionist with a master's degree in psychology. He's the best-selling author of more than 13 books, and he's been on just about every media outlet out there uh, talking about food and health. This book that we're going to talk about today is called The Great Cholesterol Myth that he co-authored with uh, renowned cardiologist Dr. Stephen Sinnott. So with no further ado, here is Dr. Johnny Bowden. So, Dr. Bowden, welcome to 40 Plus Fitness. My pleasure, Alan. This is round two. I enjoy yes, it. Yes, it is. Time. Yes, it is. The first, the first time was great, and, and I'm, I'm very, very happy and feel privileged and honored uh, to have you back on. Uh, Thank you. We really had a good discussion uh, about cholesterol in that one, and, and the, the name of this book is The Great Cholesterol Myth. Um, we're going to talk about cholesterol some more uh, today, but uh, I, I think what I took out of this book that was a little different than other, you know, I guess, uh, anti-cholesterol books or, you know, those kind of books in general is cholesterol skeptic books. Let's call them. Okay. Let's call it that. Uh, Is that you, you, you and Dr. Sinatra didn't just say, okay, cholesterol doesn't matter. Uh, You took us that next step to say, here's how you can use that, that those numbers in some way. But then there's these other four things that are actually what we ought to be paying attention to. And, And we're being distracted by, by this number. Uh, and those four things I call the four horsemen of aging. And here's an interesting factoid. Um, so when we did the great cholesterol myth, we looked at the factors that actually promote heart disease, the real ones, not cholesterol. That's a minor player, but the, the, the real factors. And we isolated four of them. Um, but I, what I wanted to say that I think is interesting is a previous book of mine which was originally written in 2008 called The Most Effective Ways to Live Longer, uh, is now being revised in, an, is a, in, in a, a revised and updated edition for 2019. And guess what? The same four factors is what contribute to early death. So not only are these four factors that I'm about to tell you major promoters of heart disease, they're major promoters of every disease. In fact, every degenerative disease you don't want to get, whether it be Alzheimer's, cancer, diabetes, obesity, heart disease, they all have these four factors playing in some proportion or another. So these are not just about heart disease. And I'll tell, now I guess you want to know what the factors are, right? Yeah. So number one is inflammation. <laughs> Number one is inflammation. Inflammation is a silent killer. We've known that since that famous Time Magazine cover about 20 years ago that said, inflammation, the silent killer. Nobody knew what it was back then. Now people are talking about it, but I don't think people really understand the enormity of the contribution of inflammatory processes to just about every disease they get. You know, we get stuffed noses and colds. We know we've got inflammation. We've got, we get, uh, you know, a splinter caught in our, our, in our uh, shins and, and we know we see inflammation. We see it'll get all red, but we don't really compre- comprehend the, the damage and destruction that chronic inflammation that flies under the radar, not the stuff you see, not the abscess on your tooth or the growth on your, uh, of a pimple or any of the inflammation signs that we, we're all very familiar with, but the stuff that goes on under the hood in our arteries and our veins that we don't see, um, that's the inflammation that kills us. And that is the number one of the four character, the four things that we identified as the four horsemen of aging, inflammation. Okay, now we can start, we can stop right there. I'll give you the, I'll give you the overview. The other, the other three, and I'm sure these are many things that you've covered on your shows because these are core subjects that everybody who's interested in health looks at at one time or another. So inflammation was number one. Number two is oxidative damage. So everything you've ever heard about antioxidants, they're all about fighting 
this horseman of aging, oxidation, oxidative damage, the kind of thing that happens inside your body that parallels what happens when you leave metal out on your front yard and in the rain. It rusts. And when you, when you rust from the inside, you've got oxidative damage. So fighting that is one of the big uh, goals, I think, of any kind of quote-unquote anti-aging program or anti-heart disease program for that matter. The number three is something you and I were talking about offline, which is stress. And I know we have a lot to say about stress, so just let me put it in context. It's one of the four biggest promoters of disease, uh, magnifiers of disease, uh, uh, amplifiers of disease, causes of disease. It's just an enormous factor in all diseases, and especially in heart disease. And I can give you some examples of that a little bit later on. And the last one is something that people may not be as familiar with. It's called glycation. And basically, the way I translate this for the general public is the number four, and actually they're not in any order because all of these are equally destructive. The fourth horseman of aging is sugar because sugar, there's no glycation without sugar. So we might as well just forget about the biochemical process known as glycation that ages you from the inside and outside. But let's talk about the cause of glycation, which is sugar. So there they are, the four horsemen of aging, inflammation, um, oxidative stress or oxidative damage, stress and sugar. Okay. Now, one of the things I, 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 I harp on my clients, and I probably shouldn't harp on them because it just probably stresses them out a little bit, but um, you know, I, I explain to them that you know, we get ourselves kind of locked into one metric. And that wet metric for most of my clients is going to be their weight. They want to lose some weight. And so they're yep. focused on that one metric. And, and I keep saying, okay, well, if you're, if you're eating whole foods, and the scale's not moving, um, what are the things that are happening inside your body that are good because of what you're doing that you just don't see? And, and I think inflammation and oxidation and glycation yeah. are yeah. all those internal things that we could go decades without recognizing uh, that it's, it's killing us, but we also can go decades when we're improving our health to just not see the needle move. Uh, what are some things that I can look for under the hood? Because, you know, I, I can go in for blood tests, other things. What are the things I can look for to know that I'm, I'm kind of on the right track with regards to those three? Well, first, Alan, I want to emphasize and underline what you just said because it was profoundly true. And it's something we, we forget about because we're in such an instant gratification kind of environment. I mean, we all are just programmed to want results and want to see results overnight. And the drug culture uh, amplifies that because we all know if you take a Tylenol, your headache's gone. So it's an instantaneous kind of result. What you were just talking about so wisely and so correctly was the fact that there are many things that don't show up for a decade or more. For many men, many, I, I don't have the figures in front of me, but they're available. They're at the National Institute of Health. You can look them up on Google. I, I'd say it's, it's, it's for a double-digit percentage of men, a heart attack is their first symptom of heart disease. The heart disease didn't start with the heart attack. Diabetes has no symptoms. I, I'm not sure of what the number is. I'm, I'm not as much of a data nerd as I guess I thought I was, but a very high percentage of diabetes cases are undiagnosed because people have no symptoms. So they don't go to the doctor. High blood sugar doesn't have a symptom. Guess what? Neither does high blood pressure. And these things are destructive source, forces in the body. I, I often use the smoking example because people get that right away. If I started smoking tomorrow, guess what? I wouldn't get cancer on Wednesday. I might not even get it in a month or two or six, but I'm going to get it. Or I'm going to have my odds of getting it increased by 80%. So understand that there's a latency period on a lot of these measures and that that doesn't mean they're not important. They're damn important. You just might not see them as readily as you would see a change in your weight. So I just wanted to underline that because you said that. Now, what are some of the things we can look for since we're not seeing it on the scale, for example? I always start with energy. There's not a person who has a ton of energy in the world who's feeling bad. So energy is a good marker for how you're doing. You know, you can't fake it. If you're not getting it from some external source like a drug or a lot of caffeine or something, your energy is going to be generated naturally, and that's a very good metric for how you're doing. How you're sleeping is a pretty good metric. How you're feeling about life and about people is a good metric because your brain and your emotions and uh, different centers of fear and pleasure in your brain are all affected by your environment and your nutrition. 
So I'd look at those basic ones. How do I feel? Um, how am I feeling about life? Do I wake up with a, any kind of energy and spring in my step? Or do I just wish I could sleep 10 more hours? Those are the metrics I'd look at while you're waiting for the scale to change. Yeah, And, and I think that's really hard to, to do, you know, the, the energy part of it. Uh, when you're, you're constantly in this state of, of, you know, eating sugar or simple carbs. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the kind of the beautiful things when you start understanding uh, what healthy fats are because of the fats that are not going to cause uh, the inflammation. They're the fats that are not going to cause oxidative damage. Um, can we recap what some of the good fats versus the bad fats are so we know how to fuel ourselves? I would love to do that, and, and I would urge everyone listening to understand that the division between good fat and bad fat, that I think more and more people are accepting. I mean, even people I know that really know nothing about nutrition, you talk about fat in the diet, they say, well, there's good fat and bad fat. It's kind of like everybody knows that, right? Here's the next level of knowledge. You've got to understand that what we think is good fat and what we think is bad fat ain't good fat and bad fat. We have been taught that bad fat is fat from animals. Bad fat is saturated fat. Good fat is anything that doesn't come from an animal or isn't saturated, like vegetable oil and corn oil. Okay, big fat lie, big fat deception here. Bad fats are damaged fats. It has nothing to do with whether they're saturated or not. There's been a wealth of evidence since 2010 that has absolved saturated fat from a causative role in heart disease. It's damaged fat. It's overused vegetable oils that, that get rancid and form uh, 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 carcinogens and uh, trans fats and things like that that are really, really bad. And vegetable oils do not get a free pass just because it came from a vegetable like corn or soy or, uh, or cottonseed or, or, or safflower does not necessarily make it healthy. Those fats are actually pro-inflammatory. And the omega-3s are actually anti-inflammatory. So they need to be in a balance. So we got to forget everything we learned about saturated versus unsaturated. Here's two great examples. Coconut oil is a saturated fat that is really good for you. People are beginning to get that. But one of the ones that they're not yet really getting on board with enough, as far as I'm concerned, is Malaysian palm oil. That still suffers from all kinds of bad uh, ideas from 20 years ago and a different source of palm oil and a time when it was tainted. Modern Malaysian palm oil is just about a health food. First of all, it's got all these tocotrienols, which are healthy for the brain. Uh, it's it's a, a sustainable fat. It's made without a lot of high heat or chemicals. It's it's a, a non-GMO. And, and people are worried because it's a saturated fat. It's a great fat. I use Malaysian palm oil all the time. I use coconut oil all the time. And I use saturated fat from healthy animals all the time, like grass-fed beef and, and uh, pastured pork and free-range chickens. Those are not the fats you need to be afraid of. What you need to be afraid of is too much of those fats that come in, uh, that look all healthy, and they come in those plastic things, and they're corn oil and safflower oil and sunflower oil and soybean oil. Too many of those lends towards inflammation, not towards anti-inflammation, and we want anti-inflammation. So that's the first thing about fats. Um, what else did you want to I know you want to talk well, about something. I guess the other side of it was, and this is always the funny thing, and I, one day I'm probably going to just say this to my doctor if he, he tells me to eat egg white omelets again. Oh, my God. Uh, is, I'm, I'm, I'm just going just gonna, to ask him. I'm going to say, okay, uh, it sounds like I shouldn't try to lose weight because I'm pretty sure that the body fat that I would be trying to lose would be saturated fat, and I don't really want that as a fuel. Um, so I just kind of, that's just one of those things that always strikes me is why, why would we store fat as a saturated fat if, if we weren't supposed to be eating saturated fat? Well, I would, I would, if you're, you're a doctor friend, I'd ask an even more pointed question. This is what amazes me about these guys that tell you to eat, whether they're doctors or not doctors. And, and I say guys, I mean, anyone who continues to advise egg white omelets, my question to them is even by their standards. And their standards are that anything that raises cholesterol is going to be bad because cholesterol causes heart disease. Even by that outdated wrong theory, we already know that eating cholesterol doesn't change your blood cholesterol. So why are they still telling us to throw away the best part of the egg? Because all, even the National Institute of Health, in USDA, they no longer consider cholesterol a nutrient of concern because the data is in. 
dietary cholesterol doesn't affect your blood cholesterol. So why are they, even the people who still believe in this cockamamie theory, why are they still advising egg whites? I, I guess it's just really hard to walk away from a paradigm you've been telling patients for, you know, ever, yeah. you know, yeah. and I, you, you, the doctor, you know, and, and, and you know, this is like our prior generations, when we went to the, when they went to the doctor, the doctor told them, you know, here, put this leech on you. Uh, they would, they would, they put the leeches. They'd take oh, yeah. the leeches. My parents' generation were like that. My parents' generation believed anything. That, then the doctor was a part, you know, he was in the community. We knew him. They weren't at big places, in personal places. We had a relationship with him. And there was a kind of doctor knows best going around. My parents, you could not question anything that Dr. Leo said. You just couldn't. It was, I hope we've come a little further than that. They are not the keepers of the faith and the guardians of our health. They are members of our health care team. And we need to be more proactive and stop just buying into every paradigm that they give us that was given to them by the pharmaceutical industry and is kind of out of date right now. Yeah. And so in talking in terms of pharmaceuticals, um, you know, a question I'll often get from my clients is, you know, should I supplement and what are some things I should supplement with? And, and, and I always uh, kind of direct them and say, look, you can go get some blood tests for the basic vitamin D, vitamin B, some of these other things to kind of just see. Uh, but in the book, you do go through uh, what I would call some of the core, uh, they're, they're supplements, but to me, they're those things, like you said in the book, is, is this is going to help you have a healthier heart. Uh, the first one is coenzyme Q10. Well, let me, let me, if I may, if I may, let me sure. back up one step before we go there um, and just put cu- supplements in an overall context. Um, you're, I'm going to guess you're more like me than the average person, but I take, I probably take 38 to 40 something pills a day or potions or drinks or, you know, some combination of nutrients in different delivery systems. I'm probably taking 40 or 50 things a day and have for most of my adult life. And they've changed, you know, depending on what I'm particularly trying to do and what I'm experimenting with. I'm, you know, a very committed biohacker that way. So I don't recommend to people that they start out with 40 or 50 things. They don't need 40 or 50 things. Most of the people who, who, who I interact with, Facebook, Facebook Live, my website, johnnybowden.com, Ask Dr. Johnny on Clean Eating Magazine, they are general, well-informed consumers who really don't want to take a lot of pills and they want to know what, what's the best like overall kind of program I can be on with the least number of things I have to take. So I would like to, at some point, address that and then we can go on to what you mentioned, which is, I'm sure, going to be coenzyme Q10 and L-carnitine and, uh, and, and things like that, because those are specifically chosen for people who have issues around their heart. And those were uh, things that Dr. Sinatra has also found to be incredibly helpful over the years. But he even also, I'm sure, would agree with me that you got to start with your basic stuff. And you, not everybody needs all the nutrients for the heart. Not everybody needs all the extra support for the liver, like some people who might have uh, hepatitis. Uh, not everybody needs additional support for the brain. It would be lovely to take all these things, but you'd be taking about 100 things a day. So there's a lot of, uh, you've got to do a little <laughs> picking and choosing when you decide how to target things. I mean, all medicines might be great, but you don't take them for every single disease, right? So it's kind of the same thing with this. You want to cover your basics which I can talk about in a minute, and I can do that with four items, and it's pretty easy for most people to wrap their minds around. And then we can talk about how these additional nutrients, like coenzyme Q10 or L-carnitine, might help someone in a particular situation, such as uh, strengthening their heart. Yes, please do. So my, I have, here's my four basic supplements, a multivitamin, magnesium, vitamin D, and fish oil. So that's I, I just uh, that's I just gave you the headline and, and those four and if you want to stop listening that's all you got to know a high quality multiple an absorbable magnesium a good vitamin D and a high quality fish oil now let's get into why one brand over another or why you would make one choice over another multiples are huge they range from the, I'm not going to disparage a brand but we all know the kind you take one of every day and they're big box stores and this this is minimum wage nutrition this is the stuff it's the it's generally the cheapest form of the nutrients so like for example magnesium oxide instead of magnesium citrate or uh, you know that kind of thing and it's usually the minimal dosages that are really at the rda and 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 there isn't a nutritionist alive who believes the rdas make any sense or that they are in any way optimal levels for people to take so a high quality one means 
you know, one that is really well formulated by people who know what they're doing and like use the right dosages in the right amounts. I'm going to tell you, I have a brands for all of these and I'm going to tell people because I, these are the ones I use. This is what I really, this is what I've vetted. For multiples, I'm 100% for Rainbow Lights Vibrance line. That's like their Lexus line. They were the first company to do vitamins from foods only, like whole food vitamins. They're very advanced in, 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 the, uh, in the advisory boards that they use. And I've looked at their formulas. Those are the ones I recommend to friends. The Rainbow Light Vibrance line for any multiple. They make a teenage um, boy, a teenage girl, a young woman, young man. They make it for every stage and age in life, and they're very well formulated. Uh, magnesium. And we're going to talk later about stress, and magnesium is one of mine and Steve Sinatra's number one remedies for, for stress, but we're talking about it here as a basic. And I like uh, at least 400, if not 800 milligrams of magnesium a day. I personally prefer to drink mine. I use Natural, uh, natural Vitality's Calm. It's a, it's a drink that fizzes up, and I kind of like the whole ritual of it because it actually it's interesting where it fizzles, and that's the oxygen uh, combining with the carbonate and, and making the magnesium citrate available to you, and it's kind of cool. Um, but it's one less pill I have to take. It's easy to remember, and I take them in little travel packets that go with me. So I take the, that, um, that natural vitality magnesium then vitamin d i'm not partial to brands because it's a very easy nutrient to make uh as long as you get the d3 form and the actual dosage is going to vary the, the vitamin d council has some good recommendations for how to bring your vitamin d up but i would recommend to everybody that they get the oh25 vitamin d blood test when they get their blood test because we should all know our levels and uh, the, the best experts that i uh, I, the people who I think have the, the most accurate and, and are thinking about this in the, in the most clear way are recommending that your ideal level will be around 50. Uh, it, it's not 20 or 30 the way the government says it should be. So you want to bring that level up. and It's very easy to do with supplements, assuming your receptors work well. And then the fourth supplement that I think is a must for everybody is fish oil. I just am a, an enormous believer. My... Um, Great nutrition um, teacher, the great late Robert Creon used to say, if I could do one thing to uh, increase the health of, of the American population, I'd put every pregnant mother on fish oil. And I know, knowing him many years, that he really meant that for the entire population, but you could certainly start with pregnant women. And I'm a big fan. I, I, I just think they're the most anti-inflammatory molecule. They undo so much damage of inflammation on so many different levels. They help with circulation. They help with the brain, with the heart. Uh, and there, and there's a form of them that I recommend because so many people tell me, oh, I burp them up or my kids won't take them. It's brutal hard to get them to take them and they need it very badly. Uh, there is a formula called uh, Seriously Delicious Omegas. It comes in, it's an emulsified omega-3. It's made by Barleen's. Barleen's. Uh, uh, in fact, it just won, the, the children's version just won the next year award at Expo East for the most innovative product in children's products. So it's, a, it's an emulsified, emulsified omega-3 that actually takes like a little bit of like a fruit compote and it's delicious and you can get kids to eat it and it's actually even better absorbed than the oil form. So those are the four things I recommend. The Rainbow Light Vibrance brand for multiples, whatever your particular demographic is, if you're young, old, middle, you know, there's a, a formula for you the natural calm uh, vitality natural vitality calm magnesium drink vitamin d by any reputable company that makes a vitamin d3 and barley's um seriously de delicious omegas for the omega 3s so that's my four cornerstone products that i can pretty much recommend across the board and they're going to benefit about 99 percent of people and then now we could talk about some of the specifics for things like heart or liver or brain or as like we've been talking about the heart yeah and and, I, and actually I, you know i try to not like i'm like you know i don't take quite as many supplements as you do i I really do base it on, on my blood test on the time of the year. Sure. Uh, if I'm eating a lot of fish, then I'll probably take less fish oil. If sure. I'm getting outside like I am now, you know, and it's, it's still 90 degrees and uh, hot, humid here. So I get out and get some good sun uh, for, for my walks that are half an hour to an hour. So uh, my vitamin D levels are, are snack on. Uh, when it starts getting cooler, um, then, then by all means, yes, I'll, I'll start doing that. So those are, those are also the four that I would say I, I take the most often. I don't take them every day um, or it's just a standard stack regularly. I, I, I do base it on what my current nutrition profile is and, and lifestyle and everything else. I'm, I 
probably need to kick up my magnesium and we'll, we'll get into that in a minute. But sure. uh, yeah, let, let's jump into these others because I, you know, sure. I hear about these, but we really haven't spent a lot of time talking about them. Uh, coenzyme sure. Q10. Great. So coenzyme Q10, uh, it's called a ubiquitone because it's ubiquitous. It's in every single cell in the body and it's manufactured in every single cell in the body. And it's the best and simplest way to think of it is a spark plug that creates energy for organs that need it and cells that need it. And there's nowhere where it's more needed more consistently than the heart because the heart doesn't get a vacation. It beats 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So it's constantly, it's a huge consumer of energy. It's like the, the America fossil pool, you know, which is it's consuming oil. And, um, and the thing is like many things, nature plays a trick on us and let's just make less of it as we get older. So we make, you know, it's one of many things we make less of collagen being another one, uh, 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 digestive, you know, uh, uh, hydrochloric acid in our stomach being another one, uh, testosterone being a third. And sure enough, this is one of the things, coenzyme Q10, that we don't make as much of as we get older. And of course, the heart doesn't stop needing it. So uh, for people, uh, cardiologists like Steve Sinatra, coenzyme Q10 is like a spark plug of energy and very, very important for heart. Um, a, a second more insidious reason that it's important is that it is it's statin drugs, which is what all the conservative, all the mainstream, uh, you know, right wing, or I, I don't want to call them right wing. I mean, the, the conservative wing of the American medical establishment is still very much in the throes of the cholesterol hypothesis. They still very much believe blood cholesterol is a causative factor in heart disease and must be controlled by statin drugs, which they think are the seventh wonder of the world. So you are very likely to be prescribed a statin drug if you are an American uh, going to a, a conventional doctor uh, for elevated cholesterol. This is not the approach I would take or that any of my colleagues would take, but it is the approach that much of mainstream medicine takes. So if you are very likely on a statin drug, your coenzyme Q10 is being depleted because one of the things statin drugs do, they're called HMG reductase, coenzyme reductase inhibitors. They inhibit an enzyme that makes cholesterol, but it also makes coenzyme Q10. Too bad for you. So now when you need it the most, you have the least amount of coenzyme Q10. So Steve recommends that people who are on statin drugs take at least 200 milligrams of coenzyme Q10 a day, and that's a lot. Uh, I recommend about 100 for everybody who's not, just as a preventative or as a general antioxidant, 60, 100, depending. But if you've got issues with the heart, and God knows if you're on a statin drug, you need more. Yeah. And, and I, I, uh, right now, I, I don't want to go down that argument of the statins because I had such a horrible experience with them. Um, yeah. I'm not a cardiologist. I'm not a doctor. I had my experiences with them, and it was, it was horrible. Um, well, I'm not telling anyone to throw their statins oh, yeah. away. That's got to be done under medical supervision. But I will tell you, I can certainly point you to the research on side effects. That they're quite considerable. They're underreported. This is all in the research. It's all uh, documented in our book, The Great Cholesterol Myth, complete with the studies that show this. Uh, and they do have a lot of side effects. And in my opinion, in Steve's opinion, their, their benefit is way less than we've been told it is. And it certainly doesn't extend to a lot of the populations who are getting prescriptions for statins drugs and that really never shown the benefit from them. So uh, I'm all for trying to see if we can decrease the number of prescription drugs we're on. I think as a general rule, that's a good idea. But, but if you're on a statin and, and you can tolerate it and you're working with your doctor, coenzyme Q10 is going to be something you want to make sure you're, you're taking. Yeah. And by the way, that's not controversial. Merck got a, got a patent. Merck got a patent, let me repeat that, for a combination of statin and coenzyme Q10, or for coenzyme Q10, I'm not sure which it was, but they, they didn't pursue it because they didn't think anybody really knew about it or cared about it. But it is very well known and non-controversial. Even your conservative doctor, if you bring it up, will admit that, in fact, statin drugs do deplete coenzyme Q10. That's not a controversial piece of information. Okay. Now I've had um, a Dr. No was on the show and, and he and I kind of got into uh, D-ribose. Um, and I know that D-ribose is kind of one of those helper cells for mitochondria. Uh, mm -hmm. helper, it helps mitochondria. Uh, how does it help my heart? Well, again, it's a, it's a sugar. D-ribose is a sugar and it, it appears to have some energy producing. And I'm using that in the most uh, general uh, sense because that's not how you know scientists would talk about it but what people report is that it seems to help them with energy 
Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's, it works with coenzyme Q10, but with, it, it, to create, I guess the best way to say it is there is a currency called ATP. That's the cellular currency of money, of energy. It's like what the cells, like we run our, we run our economy on, uh, on money, on cash, on, on checks. They run, the cells run the body on something called ATP. And this, this substance, ATP, it stands for adenosine triphosphate, is actually the, the cellular currency of energy. So you need ATP to blink your eyes. You need it to run the marathon. You need it to sleep. We need it right now to be talking on microphones. So ATP is needed for any movement, any thought, anything that the body does. So how does it make it? Well, derabos is one of the ways that it actually helps your little cellular uh, energy factories, which you call the mitochondria, to produce more ATP. So they, they act, it's like we said in the book, metaphorically, d Rebels acts like a little elf shuttling the material needed to make ATP to the factories where it's made. So they're a great adjunct in the creation of cellular energy. And that's why they're in the book, d, d Rebels. Okay. And then L-carnitine? L-carnitine is like a shuttle bus. So... I live in LA. I'll use the Hollywood Bowl analogy. You can't ever really get too close. So you, you know, wind up going, the bus drops you with the bus stop, and then you take a, a shuttle over to the Hollywood Bowl so that you don't have to park there. Well, carnitine is like a shuttle bus. And what it does is it shuttles fatty acids into the mitochondria of which we have been speaking, which is the, basically the energy production organelle in the cell. It shuttles those fatty acids into the mitochondria so that they can be used for energy. And uh, most people, I will, I will say, there's a, a good argument that most people have enough carnitine from their body, uh, from their diet. This is not true for vegetarians, by the way, or vegans, because carnitine is not in anything but meat products. Sorry. So if you're a vegan or a vegetarian, this doesn't apply to you. But many people do have adequate carnitine stores. However, it has long been thought that since this plays such a central role in the in the uh, in the transport of fatty acids into energy burning uh, factories in the cell that people who are either overweight or maybe whose heart is, is not working at, at top performance levels could possibly use a little bit of extra help with that shuttle bus. All right. So now uh, a topic that's, that's really kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, it, it was, it was, I guess of, of all the, the things that you can, focus on for health and wellness, be it, you know, food, exercise, sleep, uh, you know, my, my current focus now is, is really much more on, on stress and stress reduction. Um, right. Why is, why is stress such a, a, a bad player when it comes to heart health? I mean, it's one of the four horsemen. Uh, wh- how did it get that title um, of being part of the four horsemen? Because there's other things, you know, obviously the inflammation, the oxidation um, and the sugar, uh, we, we see that time and time again, but um, stress now in, in your book, you're, you're indicating it's it's a it's a it's just as big a player. Well, because it because you have to think of what happens in the body when you're under stress. So there's a number of ways to demonstrate this. Here's a here's a fun one. Have your listeners uh, Google the term voodoo death. There are documented cases of voodoo uh, doctors putting hexes on people and them dying. Well, why do you think that happens? It doesn't happen because something magically goes in the airways and poisons their food. They die from the stress of knowing because they buy into that system. They very much believe in that whole, uh, uh, whatever the religious order is that allows that to happen. They believe in it. And now they believe that somebody with authority has just put a hex on them that is going to, and the stress level kills them. And it's called voodoo death and it's been documented. So, Everyone should understand that what we think about has a profound effect on our physiology. This has been demonstrated a zillion times. You can demonstrate it for yourself by sitting calmly and and picturing something peaceful and wonderful and loving and feeling safe and protected. Watch what happens to your heart rate and your blood pressure. And then if suddenly you were to think about a horrible car accident with someone that you loved possibly in it, what would happen? You would not have moved from your chair, but your blood pressure will have gone up. Your heart rate will start to elevate. If we were measuring your hormones, your cortisol would be above the roof. Your adrenaline would be pumping. So what we think about these stress reactions Actions, which involve very powerful adrenal hormones, they have a profound effect on our health. They're inflammatory, for one thing. 
um, cortisol has an effect on uh, belly fat. It has an effect on energy. It has an effect on insulin sensitivity. All, all things which we all know to be, you know, major factors and players in heart disease. So <clears throat> the stress response is, was all, you have to think, Alan, what, what, did, what did nature or the geome organizing device or God or how, however you conceptualize it, how, why were we given these stress hormones? What were they supposed to do? And when you think about it, they were supposed to get us out of an emergency. So if we're a caveman and we hear some rustling in the leaves and, uh uh-oh, it's a a wildebeest coming to eat us for lunch, we immediately, what happens? Our heart rate goes up, our blood pressure starts to rise, the blood starts to pump into the legs instead of the digestive system because we got to start to run like hell. They are the fight or flight hormones. They are meant to either let us fight and prepare our bodies for that, or let us run and prepare our bodies for that. That's what the fight or flight hormones were for. They're short-term solutions to a danger. They're like first gear on a car. They get you out of a ditch. Here's the problem. We're running on the 405 North at 70 miles an hour in first gear because those stress hormones are only supposed to be elevated for a minute here and there to get you out of an emergency. Then, then it's good and adaptive stress. We live under 24-hour stress. It's chronic stress. It doesn't stop. It doesn't even stop when we go to bed. And that kind of chronic elevation of these stress hormones wrecks metabolic disaster. So that's how stress kills. I mean, it, it starts a cascade of events that, you know, we're fine if they're on you know, short time, like first gear. But if you drive in first gear for a long time, you strip your transmission. And that's what happens in the body. And and, and I I like that metaphor because I I, I think so many of us can can relate to the fact that, um, you know, we're we're in this stress perspective and and there's nowhere to really run. You know, um, Mm -hmm. uh, I I, I was writing a story, um, putting it together for the book, and I was thinking in terms of, you know, I've had moments of, of chronic stress. And I've had moments of the acute stress, you know, there's kind of that moment where, you know, okay, my boss calls me on the phone and says, come up to my office, I need to talk to you. You know, suddenly your heart rate's going and everything. And you're like, well, I I can't go and burn this off. You know, I I can walk up the stairs or I can get on the elevator and I can go up there and see him. And then I'm just afterwards, I I know I I need to go to the gym and and burn that off. But uh, I was in a situation where, you know, the CEO was not really happy with me. And so we were, we were constantly, you know, at odds and, and every day was I knew, okay, I, I've got to sit in front of this guy and, and I got to do my job and I've got to, you know, just not react to what my body is screaming at me to, to do, which was right. fight or run away. Right. Uh, neither one of those would have been a good, a good solution. Uh, right. But that energy stays in you and then does. causes, yeah, right. So it's not like it just dissipated into the ether. It's now running its hormonal game on you and all kinds of things are happening physiologically that are probably not, you know, the best for you. So if we, if we know we're in a situation and we can't in the short run do something about it, you know, get out of that job, get out of that relationship or whatever, what are some things you would advise people to do to manage their stress? Um, I would start with deep breathing. Now that's, I, I think I told you offline, I, I, Michelle and I started meditating last July. So we have just completed a year and a month or so of, of, uh, of meditation. It's taken me my entire life to be able to find, you know, a, a, a context, a way to do that. Um, I, I was one of those people who found it incredibly difficult. And I could not keep my mind still. And I couldn't concentrate on my breathing, all the other stuff that they tell you to do. And I found a method that works for me. And I do it every day, twice a day. And rarely, I mean, really, really rarely ever miss. And I think... Uh, even if you if you're like me up to a year ago and you couldn't do the full round of like you know meditating twice a day or, or even once a day for ten or fifteen or twenty minutes, try deep breathing. Try this little thing I used to do myself for years, where it's just like a four minute timeout. You sit at your desk and you literally close your eyes and you kind of like lower your heart rate and you just breathe in deeply on a count of like seven, you hold for four, I mean, I'm sorry, you, you deep and breathe in on a count of, of four, one, two, three, four, and you hold just a bit, maybe another count of four, and then you exhale on a count of seven, one, two, three, just long exhale, and the number doesn't even matter, you could reverse it, but the point is to keep some number in mind, say seven, inhale on four, hold for like six or seven counts, 
exhale and you, you set the timer on your iPhone for four minutes and do that a couple times a day. It's so little time out of your day, but it will kind of act as a partial reset of your brain waves, your blood pressure, uh, your cortisol levels. It will, it will be like a mini vacation. I don't recommend that you do. I mean, I think that it would be great if you could work up to like an actual meditative practice, but any kind of deep breathing walks in greenery seem to have remarkable restorative powers. There's an entire discipline of psychology and that's called ecotherapy that has to do with just, you know, seeing greenery, walking around in your neighborhood. If you're lucky enough to have trees, look at them. Uh, because it, there are studies even showing that in hospitals, those who have views of lawns have better metrics. I mean, there's something about seeing greenery that really is stress reducing. I am a big fan going back to supplements. Natural vitality is calm. It's called calm for a reason because it actually magnesium is very, very calming. Anybody who's ever had intravenous vitamin drips knows this because if you have an intravenous vitamin drip with magnesium in it, you will sleep like you've never slept in your life. And I speak from personal experience. I used to have these drips all the time. So I, I'm a big fan of taking that natural vitality calm. And, and I like also because for me, there's something calming in the ritual. It's not just popping a pill. It's pouring a spoonful of this into some water, watching the fizz, wait until the bubbles come up. There's, a, there's not like a 60-second ritual to doing it. And I'm a big believer that rituals are calming as well. I try to do my same four or five things every morning, like clockwork. And it, it tends to be very calming and grounding. So I think all these things, you know, can be helpful to reduce stress. Exercise certainly can help. Walks can help. Uh, meditation can help. Uh, better sleep can help. Uh, and, and, and certain supplements can help like natural vitality calm, as one example. Yeah. All right. Well, this is episode 343. Um, it, are there any links or anything, any, anyone where you'd like for me to send people to learn more about you and what you've got? I'd, I'd love them to come to the website, especially in, in a couple of weeks when it's being all redesigned. There'll be all kinds of good, cool, free stuff and eBooks and things like that. So just check in with my website, johnnybowden.com, no H and Johnny. And, you know, you can follow me on Twitter at Johnny Bowden. Just remember no H and Johnny. Cool. Well, again, as I said, this is episode 343. So you can go to 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash 343, and I'll have those links there. So uh, Dr. Bowden, thank you so much for being a part of 40 Plus Fitness. Oh, Alan, it's my pleasure. Anytime you were just a wonderful interviewer, so passionate. You actually know so much, so your questions are so pointed. Your listeners are very lucky to have you, and I've been just honored to be on your show. Thank you. Thank you. I'll have to admit that I wasn't quite sure that I would get this episode out on time. Um, as you may know, I live in Pensacola Beach, and we just had a Category 4 storm, uh, Hurricane Michael, uh, come through and did a lot of damage. Fortunately, we were uh, on the safe side of that hurricane and uh, sustained almost no damage or problems around here uh, other than the scare of it. And uh, But... Uh, my heart and prayers goes out to the people who were affected uh, in the panhandle of Florida, Georgia, and the Carolinas. Uh, I know this is a dev devastating storm and has done a lot of damage, and I'm sure there's going to be some loss of life involved. And so, again, I, I, my heart goes out to you if you've been affected by this. Um, you know, it is it is a time of year we don't typically get those kind of storms uh, of that magnitude. Uh, so this was kind of a freak one, and I, I frequent a freak one, <laughs> and I just I hope that it's not something that um, we have to deal with. I hope the season's over for 2018, uh, and we can move into uh, a better time of the year. Um, before I go though. I did want to reach out and, and ask you if you didn't mind helping the show out a little bit with a little bit of support. Um, there's two ways that you can support the show. Uh, the first one is that you know you can leave a rating and review. And if you haven't done that already, please do take the time. On your app right there, uh, there's going to be a way for you to review the show. Uh, please do that. that. That definitely helps us get out there and get noticed and let people know that we're still active and uh, you know the apps see us and, and they want to show us a little bit more when they see that you're engaging with us. Um, and then the, I come up with a new way that you can support the show. And it's a really cool, it's a service called Patreon. And what Patreon lets me do is provide additional perks, if you will, uh, for people that do want to financially support the show. Um, and I've set up four levels 
that allow you to be even more engaged and involved with the creation of the show. Uh, Mention on the show notes, among a lot of other things, to even being live with the recording uh, when I'm doing the interviews. So you'll actually be there when I'm asking the questions uh, as we go and be a part of the creation of the podcast. So um, you can go to 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash Patreon, and I'll, I'll spell that out for you. It's 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash P A T. R-E-O-N. And that'll take you to our Patreon page. Uh, they make it really easy for me to give these extra perks out and for you to support the show. So go check it out. I put a little video up there to explain it a little bit better. Uh, so please do go to 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash Patreon and help support the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast and let me help even more people the way I'm trying and working to try to help you. Next time on the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we meet Dr. Kenneth Pelletier and discuss his book, Change Your Genes, Change Your Life. It was a real cool conversation I know you're going to enjoy. But until then, have a happy and healthy day. 